Welcome to our Internet Recap Weekly, where we dive into the highlights you may have overlooked. If you crave captivating, gratifying, and mind-bending tales, you've come to the right place. Remember to show your support by liking and subscribing, ensuring you stay in the loop with the freshest gossip from unfamiliar faces. Share the timestamps of your preferred stories in the comments section below. Let's get started, shall we? Engineers, what's something that's designed into a machine solely because of the stupidity of human beings? Viewer's edition. Story 1. So I created an HTML application with a CSS progress bar. This app did absolutely nothing. It was just an endlessly looping progress bar that would appear on the customer screen so these dumb butts could see something happening. On the back end, I put in a customizable timeout function you could set as a parameter, invisible to the customer on the actual work scripts. If the customer said, I just need this done real quick, thanks, timeout equals zero milliseconds, and we'd be done in a couple of minutes. If the customer got on the phone and started stressing how catastrophic the issue was and how nobody could solve it, I knew they wouldn't be satisfied that we had done our due diligence in two or three minutes. So timeout equals 720,000 milliseconds, and we'll call them back in two hours to let them know it's done. The same scripts run, same work was accomplished, but we'd make them wait for a resolution so they didn't call back to complain about us. Complaints drop to almost nothing, at least as pertains to the quality of our work. They still complain about our bill, <laughs> and it's not billed hourly, so I don't feel bad about it. So the placebo effect is real, alleviating the pain in my butt every time. I don't mind saying this, as the company was sold off after I left, so things are probably run differently now. I'm well beyond any non-disclosure agreement, which I incidentally never signed, and they screwed me anyway, so screw them. I have a much better job now for a much better company, and this type of tactic is nearly ubiquitous with all help desks. If you panic and make a big deal out of a trivial problem, everyone will pay their time to make it seem like it was more difficult than it really is, just so you can feel validated and they can cover their butts. If you're more relaxed and actually trust the people you pay to do a job to actually do that job, things will get done a lot quicker. Just chill out and everything gets fixed a lot easier. Oh, and another example. If you want to know why most remote connection software changes your desktop wallpaper when someone is connected to your machine, it's because there is a shocking amount of hardcore gay corn used as desktop wallpapers that the technicians don't want to see. Probably one in every 50 machines we connected to had a dong pic as the wallpaper and each technician was servicing 25 to 50 machines a day. That is the only reason your wallpaper goes black when people connect to you. The ubiquitous feature exists for no other reason than people don't want to see geriatric penises. When asked, technicians will make up other excuses for why it does that, but the real reason is penises. Lots and lots of penises. And I almost forgot, we made another placebo app, kind of as a joke, Digital Holy Water, a lot of older customers, especially in the Bible Belt, seriously do attribute things like malware to demonic possession of their PC. I'm seriously not joking. It wasn't an everyday occurrence, but anyone working there for longer than a few months would have gotten at least one of those calls. The devil's got my computer. Help! We wrote them off initially as prank calls. They were serious, though. So we made a version of my progress bar that had a crucifix on it, and the idle text that explained what step it was on was replaced with prayers we found via Google, just copied and pasted in. It didn't do anything different, we just wrote it as a joke on our break after receiving yet another one of these calls. But one of the junior techs got a call and actually ran it on a customer's PC, which we had never actually intended for it to be run on, and before we knew it, the customer had told their church group, and we got even more of those calls. This was bad for us. If the higher-ups found out, we'd have been fired. PC exorcism wasn't a service we actually offered, and since they were paying for the service, it borders on fraud. We never made any false claims, but it would not have been a good look for the company. So we did damage control after work. I wrote a new malware removal script in the same style, but added features like switching them to a corn-blocking DNS address, changing to a Christian-friendly search engine by default, etc., along with removing and blocking the top 200 common malware packages of the day. The script actually worked, albeit in a limited fashion, and we dumped it online as freeware and just pointed people there if they asked about it, but made no claims that it was our app. We should have monetized it. It got like 100,000 downloads. I probably would have made more from that than I did the actual job, but profiting off of that would be a little too sleazy for me. It was just supposed to be an inside joke. So yeah, lots of features and technology only exist because people are stupid. Dare I say most features only exist for that reason. 
For every line of code that does something useful, there are 200 that prevent the user from doing something stupid. Story 2. Key thing to remember about safety features is that odds are that they exist because before they existed, someone killed or badly injured themselves or others by being dumb. The more invasive the feature, the bigger the body count. I work in IT, a generally safe profession. A team I used to work on ran a test and commissioning lab. When a new system was introduced, we'd build the servers for testing and then use the results to design and commission the production servers. This was before virtualization and the cloud. This meant that there was a degree of doing hardware builds in our job, so we had a crate of tools to open up cases, some of which were specific to the fastenings used by the supplier, so you had to complete a supplier course to be permitted to use. Not usually for safety reasons, they just didn't want any ham-fisted idiot poking around inside, causing support calls because they didn't know what they were doing. The lab was a locked room on the same floor as our office, with a strict rule that anyone not on the team had to be accompanied by a senior member of the team before they entered. The total value of hardware and parts in the lab was a few million pounds, and it also contained the main power distribution panels for the floor. One day we were having some new power points fitted in the main office, taking out singles and replacing them with doubles and running extra cable to supply the extra load. The team deputy manager had accompanied the electrician to turn off the panel he was connecting to, and the one that ran to power to the existing singles. A couple of hours later, a junior member of the team came up looking for the tool crate which the deputy manager gave him access to, and he took a pair of pliers out. I asked him why he needed pliers, and he just said he needed to get something off of something. I followed him, he went into the test lab, to the power distribution panels, and started to try to remove the electrician working do not touch tags attached to the main breakers. Each switch had a hole near the end that matched up to a hole in the panel. The electrician had run the wires of the rags through these holes. The junior team member was trying to undo the wires. On the panels, the electrician was working on the power points connected to. I stopped him, took the pliers off him, and walked him out to the head of the department's office. That was next to the test lab to report the health and safety violation. This was far from his first failure to follow the rules. His excuse was that he wanted to charge his phone and all the live points near his desk were in use. The team manager and deputy were called in. All he got was a telling off to be more careful in the future. I went and told the electrician what had happened, and he dug a couple of small padlocks out of his toolbox, which is what he should have used to lock the breakers open, not just the twisted wire of the tags, to prevent reoccurrence. Story 3. Oh, hell, my time to shine. I'm a quality assurance manager, and my entire career is in this. Why does this exist? How can this be? Did this not come up in testing? Two options. Number one, yes, it did. We raised it and escalated it, and it was decided that it was worth releasing as nobody gave a poop. So the business pushed it out knowing people might do it, but it would make more money just to release it. Number two, no, we didn't find it because in a room full of very smart people who spent years doing market research and user acceptance testing, with private and public beta releases, nobody thought to do what you just did. Seriously, I love the general public. They think of ways to screw up multi-billion pound platforms in ways we could never have predicted. Number three, legal. This was found and raised, and someone decided that the huge amount of ticked-off users that were massively inconvenienced would not matter compared to the six people that would sue us if it didn't do the thing. Holy poop, I worked for Network Rail, UK Rail Admin, and have info on this too. The reason they're pushing for the split barriers, where one side comes down and then the other a short while later, is because people are stupid enough to try and drive around them. It goes like this. No barriers were in place, equals people drove on and got creamed by a train. So, full barriers across both lines were in place, equals people on the crossing, when it came down, got creamed by a train. So, half barrier on only your side of the road, so people could drive on if they were in the crossing, equals people drove around the half barrier and got creamed by a train. So, delayed full barrier, where your half comes down first, and then a few seconds later the other side comes down, giving people time to move off, but not circumvent it. Equals people realize this, see the flashing red lights, and accelerate into the other lane to try and get around the barrier before it closes. So, screw this, I'm out. You think your M badge means you can beat a god dang freight train over a five yard space? Go for it. Just remember to adjust your wills to account for the cleanup fee. God dang. I should just get to the end before I rant, but user interface delay tactics, the thing about if I can't see it, it must be broken. ATMs. I worked on these for a couple of years, and I guarantee that whatever transaction you selected was completed within a fraction of the time you think. Want to pay a check in? Okay, beep beep.
Beepity beep, 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 done. Those beeps are all fake. We did it 20 seconds ago, but we got sick of people calling to check. It blipped up way too fast. Are you sure it really went through? I don't know how it did it that fast. Loads of transactional data are sent almost instantly, and the user interface you see is just comforting headpats. Story 4. Used to work as a glass dropper, a glazer, in a window factory. Had a large glazing machine that I knew how to run perfectly, tuned to max output, and fix better than maintenance. Most lines had two glass droppers, while I was the only one for my line because I consistently put out 120 plus drops by myself, while the other lines were getting 100 drops on average, and only 120 or more on a really good day with two people. Factory is getting bigger, making more money, so they tell us that they're buying all new automated glazing machines. I flipped my crap and told them they can kiss their high drop output goodbye. They had one of those new and wonderful machines in the middle building already on the picture window line, so I knew how it ran. They promised me that it was faster than any manual operator could be. I told them they were diptongs. I said what I wanted and did what I wanted because I was too good to fire. This started after I learned I was too good to be promoted, so I figured it must work both ways and was correct. Anyways, the new machines come in, run at a preset speed and 1200 PSI, I could run it 10 times faster manually and knew it could safely handle 2000 PSI. They also had light curtains that made the whole process stop and restart anytime you so much as put a finger through the light curtain. This was so freaking stupid, both because the machine had literally zero parts that could hurt a person, maybe a slightly painful bump to the head if you stuck your face in the way of the nozzle arm, at most, is how non-dangerous it was and also because the fancy, wonderful, automated machine constantly missed the freaking corners, so you had to break the light curtain to fix it. There were many other reasons the light curtain was stupid, but those are the biggest. Anyways, our drop count went from 120 or more to an average of 30. The bosses were ticked off. They tried blaming me because the other lines are doing just fine with the new machines, until I pointed out that the other lines are doing exactly the same as they were before because they suck so much that the machines are basically the same as them. Long story short, there were two of the older machines left that were meant to go to the lowest output lines of older model windows we didn't make much of anymore. One of those machines went to me instead. I heard the CEO, we were getting bigger but still only like a company of around a thousand people, was super ticked off that the third newest line, the M600 line, my line, was back to an older machine. I like to think I'm pretty awesome for getting my way, but the truth is that our particular window design didn't work well with their automated BS anyways. Like I said earlier, it always missed the corners and maintenance couldn't figure out how to fix it, so that was a big part of why I got my way. Story 5. A useful frame of mind when designing industrial machinery is the best place for an e-stop button is a place that you almost always bump into while using the machine. As bad as it is if you have to reach for the e-stop, the worst things happen if you actually have to look for it. If you cannot accidentally hit the e-stop during normal operation, you might have trouble hitting it in an emergency. I operate a mechanical press, but I'm trusted not to stick myself between the dies in normal use and have a crash block to put between the top and bottom when I have to do any work on the tooling. The crash block is tethered to the machine in a way that putting it in place breaks the e-stop chain as an extra layer of safety. The power must be locked out. My particular job allows me the luxury of needing to find the pedal before each press cycle. Other jobs require much tighter timing, so operators run the risk of cycling the press from muscle memory any time that they step towards it. So they have very long brushes to grease things so they can not only do it without sticking in their arms, but they do not have to even step towards the press. As a press operator, you need good impulse control, and we are all inculcated with the fact that if you see something wrong after you start the press cycle, there is nothing that you can do but watch. Hopefully, you will learn something not to do. Someone lost the fingertips of one hand from noticing too late that the part being struck was crooked. Me, I just watch the part and tooling get mangled, explain everything to my supervisor, and wait for the tool setters to replace the broken or bent bits of tooling as I toss the mangled part into the scrap bin. To help with learning from the mistakes of others, short of repeatedly doing the same stupid thing, no mistake will get you terminated, except not wearing your PPE, which will get you fired to keep you safe, so long as you honestly explain what happened. Destroy a press because the crash block tether was long enough to put the crash block in place without untethering it? Sorry that we had to find that out the hard way, but all others will be checked for length. 
Misguided OHS directive removes all of the tethers, a crash block goes missing, and nobody knows what happened to the press? You bet the liar that feigned ignorance was fired. As everyone was expecting an incident like this to happen, he would not have been blamed for forgetting that placing a crash block no longer disabled the press. Story 6. Good computer software has an unbelievable number of sanity checks to make sure the data the users entered aren't fundamentally insane, and error messages for when they are. Just for example, any time the user is allowed to enter a date, it has to be checked to verify that the date actually exists. No 0000 1334 2675 82. No February 30th, etc. And various other ways the dates could be bonkers. For example, that you aren't scheduling a meeting in the distant past. Numerical data have to be checked to see that they're actually numbers first before checking that the numbers make any kind of sense. A single user entered piece of information can have a dozen or more sanity checks on it individually, and that's before you start checking that the various data aren't nonsense in combination with another. For example, the end date is before the start date. A meeting is scheduled to last 10,000 years, so no one can book conference room 3 for anything else ever again. If the database field for the user's name can only hold up to 65,535 bytes, the program has to actually check that the user didn't enter more than that. It isn't only stupidity you're worried about here, deliberate attacks that cause problems on purpose can be an issue too. Every single one of these checks needs an error message, and you have to run that error message past several categories of users, programmers, sysadmins, power users, end users, and abject idiots, to ensure that it's reasonable for all of them. Among other things, this means it has to be unique, attention-grabbing, memorable, and not too scary so that the user will notice the error message, think it's coherent enough to remember, remember it, and report it to the appropriate computer geek, who will then have enough information to diagnose the problem. Ticking all of these boxes at once is a challenge. And yes, somebody will absolutely try to put a hard page break in the middle of a file name, ship a package to a fictional country, and use a proposed emoji character that absolutely no fonts support yet as their username, because of course they will. Story 7. The paper cutter mentioned resurfaced a memory from when I was 19, I'm about 57 now, working the summer between semesters at a bindery that produced softcover books. The machine had a three-foot blade, razor sharp, that trimmed two-foot stacks of tag board used for the book covers. It used 35,000 psi of pressure, if I remember correctly. For safety measures, it had two separate handles above, one for each hand, and a foot pedal. The blade wouldn't cut down diagonally until all three were activated. Cue the idiot. He had rigged the upper handles with an older fashion clothes hanger. These were the metal ones with a cardboard tube across the bottom. He rigged the handles so that pulling down on the hook of the hanger activated both handles. He was always standing on the pedal. The table of the machine was machined smooth and with the aid of silicon spray made moving the two foot stacks much easier. A two-foot stack of tag board weighs more than you might think. He oversprayed the surface, and while adjusting the stack with his left hand and his right hand on the hanger hook, the stack scooted forward much easier than normal, like a tire hydroplaning on water. This caused him to pull down on the hook of the hanger, and since he always stood on the foot pedal, activated the blade. It went straight through his wrist. The first anybody else knew about it was when we heard something bumping along and accelerating through the ducts of the air vacuum designed to collect all the paper scraps from web presses to binders and dump them into a bailing room. Everyone had to help search the baler for the hand. Very glad I wasn't the one who found it. And I got the visual of the cross-section of a wrist as he stood holding his handless arm and white as a ghost. He never screamed or anything. By the way, it was reattached, but I heard he never could close his hand more than halfway and was fired for bypassing safety measures. Pretty sure the company didn't have to pay for the medical expenses either because of the same reasons. Story 8. When I was in college, my summer job was working at an arboretum as a tree cutter's assistant and heavy equipment operator. Dutch elm disease was a big concern, so in addition to general pruning, the tree crew occasionally had to destroy a stand of trees. The wood chipper we used for this was one of the big jobs, fully capable of ingesting entire trees. We'd use a tractor to shove anything under 15 inches in diameter into the machine, and just stand back while it sucked 60 plus feet of tree in automatically. If you look at most commercial wood chippers, you'll notice a bar that loops around the outside of the intake. 
that's not there for reinforcement or to protect the machine, if an operator were to get sucked in, pushing this bar in the direction of travel will stop and or reverse the machine's inlet rollers. I got to experience this firsthand one lovely day. I was following the rules, PPE worn, standing to the side of the chute outside a safety panel, except the cuff of my glove got caught on a branch of the limb I was chipping and started to drag me over the top of the safety guard and into the machine. I learned why sometimes these things don't prevent tragedy. Surprise! A bit of pain. I didn't make it to the rollers, so wasn't directly injured by the machine, but sharp wood and getting pulled over a thin metal guard is not comfortable. Disorientation and difficulty getting a hand onto the safety bar meant I was slow to engage the safety. In fact, the seam on my glove failed almost simultaneously with me hitting the bar. Had I not been able to get away, it still would have saved my life, but maybe not my arm. Yeah, some equipment deserves a lot of your respect, or even the best idiot proofing won't save you. Ex-prisoners, who was the most evil person there, and what did they do that was so bad? Viewer's Edition. Story 1. Warning, if you hate child abusers, this one may hit home. Wasn't a prisoner, was a witness for this one actually. I remember the trial of a person who would serially end people's lives. He was former military, I was enlisted in the Marines myself at the time, and the government buries its monsters deep. I've actually been combing the internet for information on this one, and to my knowledge, I haven't seen mention of it anywhere. The guy was codenamed The Colonel, so if anyone else can find info on it, please let me know. He had a thing for girls between the ages of 7 and 11 years old, did things to them I'm not putting online, but he filmed it, so evidence was not an issue. He made them beg to end the abuse, knowing full well it meant the end of their lives. And they did. Convincing a kid that's just starting their life that whatever they're going through is worth ending is not an easy thing to do. By the time he was caught, he destroyed six families, all other Marines, and had ended nine young girls. Turned out he had a pair of daughters himself. They put his oldest on the stand. There was no question of guilt. It was really down to sentencing. Everyone in attendance knew she was arguing against the penalty of ending his life. Up until that point, people were under the impression that her plea not to go for the penalty was based on a sense of sympathy. This was a monster, but it was her father after all. That's not the argument she gave. An 11-year-old girl stared down a room full of very angry, stubborn, vengeful adults who wanted to end her father's life. Ballsy as frick in its own right. But her entire testimony took about 45 seconds and she changed every mind in that room. I don't remember the whole thing, but the part that stuck with me was, the ones who passed were lucky. They got away. He doesn't get away so easily. The kid didn't show an ounce of emotion but wanted that creature to live a long, empty existence devoid of any meaning, human compassion, or even the option of empathy. Imagine for a moment what it takes, the horrible things you'd have to do, to convince your own child that ending your life is not a punishment, but an escape. Chilled me to the bone. That one disappeared and the government lost the key, but they didn't end his life. Story 2 while some people are destroyed by a terrible childhood and never recover, some people are just born evil. I'll take two people on my husband's side of the family. His little brother's mom is not a bad person, but very damaged. She was abused her whole life. Her mom started pimping her out at around five. She spent her life as a stripper and met my husband's dad, who is literally a disgusting human being and also abused her. She's now with a man who isn't crazy or abusive and encouraged her to get help. She has a big heart, but is still a messed up person. She's hard to be around. His biological mom had two parents that were saints. Honestly, some of the nicest, most loving people I've ever met, and she's a manipulative, lying, abusive monster. Her own dad said they tried to get her help when she was younger, but nothing stuck. There's no reason in her background that would suggest that she would be as evil as she is. She just is. Luckily, my husband wasn't raised by his parents, and we were able to break the cycle of broken homes and abuse in both of our families. A bad childhood is obviously never an excuse to commit crimes and or hurt people, but in most cases, the most horrendous criminals have tragic upbringings. But there are sometimes people who are just born bad. In my town, there was just a story of a nine-year-old that executed his mother for waking him up a half an hour earlier. 
and not buying him something from Amazon. He ordered what he wanted after he ended her life. When the cops were talking to him, he had zero remorse for ending the mother's life and asked if his package had arrived. Turns out the boy had a history of starting fires, hurting younger family members, and had even broken a puppy's leg after picking the puppy up by the leg and throwing him into the wall. The family had tried to get this boy help, but it seemed he was born a sociopath and had no conscience. You can't grow a conscience. Story 3. A guy I grew up with shot his father over a dog. We all called his dad Wolfman, and he was Wolf Boy. He had a history of torturing and ending the lives of small dogs. He slit his dad's beagle's throat in an argument. He taped a small dog's legs together, and when his father and the owner of the dog came into his room, he shot his own father, stepped over the passed away body, stole his stepmom's phone, called his grandma, then ran. His girlfriend and him physically stepped over his passing away dad to get their shoes that they forgot to grab the first time. In a letter, Wolf Boy, who couldn't read or write, had sent to his cousin, he said he wished to beat the freaking prosecutor's butt and inquiring if Eric still had the SKS. He also stated in the letter that he could beat her butt with that from a long ways, especially if he still got that scope on it. My dad was the only Eric with an SKS where this happened. That is an evil person. Shot his dad, planned to shoot his stepmom, and ended the lives of small animals for fun. He once jammed a stick into my brother's bike wheel because he thought it was funny when he fell. He threw my beagle through a plate glass window when I was six. He ended his father's life when I was nine and got sentenced when I was 13. The messed up part is because the prosecution admitted evidence that pertained to his past behaviors, he has a chance to get the ruling thrown out and walk free. He's still fighting it as of the last time I checked. Story 4 one of my cousin's cousins from his mother's side ended the lives of both her kids when she found out her husband was cheating on her. She didn't even do it by poisoning them. They were hacked to pieces with a machete while the kids were sleeping. She tried to end her husband's life too when he came back that night, but he managed to overpower her and ran with a deep cut on his back to his neighbors who then alerted the police. She tried to feign psychosis, but the psychologist determined while she has ASD, she was in full control of her thought processes when she ended the lives of her kids. My cousin was there during the sentencing, and during the sentencing, she just laughed and stared at her husband menacingly. She was sentenced to life in prison, even though many thought she would get the chair. However, there's no justice here because she became the one you don't mess with in prison due to her size and violence capability, according to my cousin. Apparently, she is mostly in isolation because she blinded an eye of one of the female wardens when they came to do their spot check. She has largely been erased from my cousin's mother's family record to ensure she is forgotten. I don't know what happened to the husband, but according to my cousin, the guy looks like a living corpse. And some of the insensitive ones from the family partially blamed him for his children's passing away because of his affairs. Story 5 Ex-foster kid here, Lifer, I knew a girl that tried to end the lives of both her dad and older brother. Child Protection Services failed her till after she acted. Her dad and brother had been pimping her out to pay bills, drugs, and food so they didn't have to work. It started when she was four when her mom passed away from alcoholism. She was 11 when she finally tried to get away and was beaten so badly she almost passed. Then she got her first menstrual cycle and was so scared she'd get pregnant, she tried to end the lives of them to get away. The brother had found her pads and beat her and arred her with a big wrench, saying he'd make her sterile and she's not ever getting out just by getting pregnant. When cops and DYFS, CPS now, got to the hospital, she told them everything. Her dad survived, but just only. She had set him on fire while he was having a heroin nap. Her brother was meant to walk into his bedroom before coming to find her. She had set up an acid bomb over the door to swing down and hit him in the face when he opened the door. He had gone to the bathroom first and found her stash of pads behind the towels on the shelves, came to fix her, and her screams were finally reported by a woman next door. Story 6 I'm sorry, but story six really ticks me off. Things like that remind me why I support the death penalty. Some people just don't deserve their life, and it's not fair to make taxpayers pay to keep them alive behind bars. If you're a chomo, you're gone. If you end someone's life, you're gone. If you take a life, you should lose yours, unless accidental. 
People like that leader dude aren't useful to society and are only a danger. Why keep them alive? Yeah, if I seem to be too dramatic or passionate about this, that's because I was abused as a child. That was 20 years ago, and I can't function as a normal adult. I'm not far from it. Imagine the life I could have had. I had dreams and goals. Here I am, almost 30, can't work, I cry every single night, been ignored by people for years, and even had had my mom shame me for things that weren't even my faults. Sad thing is, I'm not the only one out there who's living in this reality. It truly does ruin a child's life, and the dude who did it passed away before he could face consequences. So I'm the one who still loses in the end and suffers. Story 7 Story 13 of Offering Deals I agree that offering deals with us is a bad idea from personal experience. Pregnant with my twins, fiance and I were hit head-on by a drunk driver for the 13th time. The police offered a deal they won't hit him with another DUI if he snitches on three drug dealers. This is less than 12 hours after we got hit. My fiancé and unborn twins passed away a week later from injuries from the wreck. I asked the police, when are you going to press charges against the driver for the wreck? That's when they said, oh, we forgot to tell you, he took the deal. While they were in a pickle for ending someone's life who doesn't have a time, they ran out and now if we charge him for the three deaths, then we have to let the drug dealers go. Before the bleeding hearts say we'll end the lives of hundreds of people a year, one, it was their choice to do drugs, and two, my fiancé was less than two weeks from getting medical license as an emergency doctor, with she was also working to get an anesthesiologist and cardiac license, so she should have saved hundreds of people, and the twins who never got the choice. Throw away time, what's your secret that could literally ruin your life if it came out? Viewer's edition. Story 1. You know, my now girlfriend, let's call her JW, was in an extremely similar, if not exactly the same situation before she met me as the story from 1433. She didn't like the people she hung out with in middle school at the time, but due to the fact she had nobody else to go to, she stayed. They'd be total witches to her regularly, and she wasn't as happy and joyful as I was, and still am, so used to seeing her as is. Fast forward to November 2016, I moved to the same school district and have absolutely no friends for that very reason. First person I met was one of her toxic friends, unknowingly, and being the hyperactive extrovert I was, made a total fool out of myself. I remained in classes alone and silent as I went from hyperactive extrovert to semi-introvert in a matter of one or two weeks. Then one fateful day, I'm in Spanish class, and we had a group project. As a luck would have it, JW and I were placed in a group together, and we instantly clicked. And by instantly, I mean instantly. We became extremely close friends for six years. Jessie cut ties with her toxic friends, who despised me with a passion, and even tried separating her and I to no avail. And she and I made new friends. She became the playful, lovable, hyperactive weirdo I've known her as since we met. Despite the school's rumors of us dating, we didn't have any feelings for each other, or so I believed. So we both tried having relationships with different people. I had long-distance ones, didn't last. What people say is definitely true while she got extremely toxic boyfriends. I despised all of them with a passion. As it turns out, my reasoning for hating each of her boyfriends so much was because of a jealousy I was completely unaware of, and I had feelings for her, but was in denial. She actually had feelings for me since we met, but pushed it down as she was too shy to admit it, and tried distracting herself with other relationships. In the end, I took her to prom, was crowned prom king to my utter amazement and confusion, as I had no idea what was going on at the time. Amazing night nonetheless. At the time this is posted, we've been in a relationship for approximately five or six months and still going strong. My girlfriend had a very bad school life before I came along, became friends instantly, both our school lives improved, denied liking liking each other, dated six years later in senior year, relationship going strong. Sorry if my story seems a bit confusing at points, I'm not exactly the best at explaining things. I also understand this has nothing to do with the actual question of the video, but that specific timestamp reminded me a lot of this. Story 2. On the rag in the water heater story, it's what happens when landlords try to save a couple dollars. I did HVAC repair and installation. In my state, homeowners can do HVAC in their own home, provided they get a permit from the government, and have the work inspected by a government inspector. Landlords are not permitted to do HVAC in their rentals. The work must be done by a licensed professional. Rentals are inspected by the government every two or three years in most municipalities. 
The inspectors are pretty good about keeping tabs on what equipment is in what given rental. The rental inspectors don't inspect the HVAC per se, they just keep tabs on what equipment is where. The landlord must have the equipment inspected and certified safe by a licensed professional prior to the government inspection. A landlord who's caught doing HVAC in their rentals is fined and must hire a licensed professional to inspect the equipment. We had an older lady who owned several rentals. She'd always try to do shady stuff and get caught. I'd be sent off the job and find some horrible, life-threatening crap she'd done. She'd then proceed to rant about how I and the government were trying to ruin her. Water heaters produce carbon monoxide that needs to be vented to the outside. One time, she and her son replaced the water heater in a rental. They did it right after an inspection, so it would be a couple years before they were caught. They hooked up the vent incorrectly, and CEO was backing into the house. The tenant and her kids started getting flu-like symptoms after the heater was installed. She called the rental inspector, the rental inspector called the HVAC inspector, he shut down the water heater, and the rental inspector ordered the landlord to vacate the house until the water heater was repaired. This woman almost ended the lives of her tenants, and had to put them in a hotel for a couple of days. It was winter, and people without heat took precedence, so it was a few days before we, or anyone, could get to her. She was fined and had to pay for us to fix her mess. As usual, she screamed bloody red rum about how she was being railroaded by me and the government. All she understood was money, money, money. She also wasn't even shy about asking for a discount. Said she wouldn't make any money if she had to pay full price. We never gave her anything off. Our rate was pretty low. If we gave her a discount, we wouldn't make any money. She still screamed that we were robbing her cheap butt. Story 3 That one with the F off to the dad that ended his own life is similar to my story. My dad was pretty run-of-the-mill dad up until I was about nine and my parents divorced. I lived with my mother primarily from then on. My dad would virtually not exist for years at a time for maybe a happy birthday message, but every now and again he would ask for a place to stay for a few days, which ended up being months or years, usually unemployed. He was also a problem alcoholic, though he made efforts to get sober. Both my mother and I were getting very annoyed with his always being around and expecting our household operations to run around him. One time after being there for almost two years, he randomly disappeared for several days. We thought he finally found somewhere else. He then showed up about a week later, walked into the house, and passed out. Definitely seemed like after a bender. Bought with a portion of the staggering amount of money he owed my mother. I had to use my lunch break and come home and leave a note for him that said, When you wake up, you need to get all your stuff out or I'll get it out for you. I came home for several days. Turned out he ended his life in the garage. I've always felt like normal people would feel some guilt from this, but truthfully, I never have. Clearly, he had other things going on in his head that he never communicated with us. One thing I do feel guilty about, though, is the dreams I sometimes have. I'll dream that suddenly my dad's back. There's a brief happiness I feel. Then he immediately goes back to sitting in the recliner and watching TV. And it makes me angry when I see it. I don't have the dreams as much anymore because I feel like my brain has ample acceptance of his unaliveness now, but I've never shared this story and only my mom knows the details, so it feels somewhat relieving to share it. Story 4 I have a secret, but it's not so bad as the stories in here. I feel really bad for them and sorry they had to go through that, and may the ones who are gone, RIP, for the people in the stories. Anyways, here's one of my stories. One of my cousins taught me about making out and stuff, then they forced me to do it with them, and even if somebody was there, they would tell me to go under the blanket and do it. I thought it was normal, so whenever they came over, they would force me to do it. Later on, I wasn't comfortable and told them, since I found out it was wrong, they said that if we could do it one more time, and then they'll stop. We did, but the other time they visited, they tried doing it again, but I told them I didn't want to. Later on, they visited me this year, or last year, I don't remember, but they tried to force me into vaping. They even told me about weird stories in their class about kids jerking off. I was calling my partner once, and they just talked about the things we did when we were younger in front of my partner. I just tried to ignore them, but they got annoyed and just walked out of the room. My partner was quiet the entire time, and we just hung up later on because it was kind of awkward. They still forced me to vape every time I saw them. I haven't seen them for a while now, so I'm not sure if they're still vaping or something, but yeah, whenever I try telling someone, they start talking about their problems or just ignore it and talk about something else. 
Except for my partner, we aren't together anymore. Also, this happened when I was six and ended when I was nine or ten. Story five. I've been abused since I was nine, so I can understand how and why they feel. But I've found out if you find a good therapist and tell them about it, once it's out in the open, it's like a ton of garbage has been lifted off your shoulders. You must realize you were a child and had no control over what happened. You were in no way to blame for what happened to you. So you have got to forgive yourself of your false guilt. Then you can start to understand how and why you think the way you do because of the abuses you suffered from your childhood. For me, I found peace within myself, and I've even been able to forgive not only myself for false guilt, but I've also been able to forgive my abusers. I've come to realize that we were young at the time, and not only that, but I came to understand that he was acting out on me, what was being done to him by his uncle. I will say therapy really works. If you're willing to do the work, a therapist can't give you the answers to your innermost emotional feelings, thinking, behaviors, actions, and good or bad choices. For those questions, the answer is within, if you are willing to face them. Sorry for the rant, but it ticks me off when victims blame themselves for something that they had no control over. I know I've been there. I felt the inner pain, self-hatred, false guilt, shame, and the suffering that goes with it. Get help. It's not a crime to seek help. It's only a crime if you don't ask for the help and suffer in silence. Story 6 Hiya. I'm someone who experienced a very, very similar situation to hers, except I'd actively state my objections and he'd manipulate me into easing up and minus the seppuku since he still lives with me. So as someone who was in that situation of being manipulated by an older brother into those types of scenarios as a kid, when you're young and don't realize what's happening in the moment and only realize later after all the years of knowing your brother as, well, your brother, your family, someone you do love as your family, someone who lives with you, you don't just go, oh, he did this horrible thing to me, so I hate him now. It seems like the next logical step, even if you know what happened was wrong and that he knew what he was doing and he knew he shouldn't have done that, it's hard to get to the point of hatred because you still have this image in your mind of your brother being anything else but an incestuous pedophile. I've spent many, many years in conflict because I'm angry. I'm angry at what he did. I'm angry about what it's done to me in the long term. And I'm angry at myself because I refuse to take any action to even get him out of the house because I still care about him as my family. And I don't want bad things to happen to him even when I have the perfect opportunity to do so. She definitely should recognize that she was in fact being exploited, but I understand why she views it the way she does. Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.